I want to talk to us today about a topic that every one of us has dealt with if you've been alive. I mean, if you've had some conscious thought, if you're, if you're more than, than two or three years old, you've dealt with this one word, this one thing in our lives. And I thought with all the stuff that's going on in the world today, uh, we, need to, we need to know how to, how to be this. And uh, it's, it's uh, something we're going to deal with. And you're going to deal with it. You may be dealing with it right now. You probably are. And if not, you'll be dealing with it this afternoon or tomorrow. But I want to talk to us on the topic today on how to be content. How to be content. I mean, how many of you know the world is just, it's a whirlwind. I mean, I remember growing up and, and it would get close to, well, a little bit before now. You went to uh, you went to whether it was uh, J C Penney or Dillard's or Sears and Roebuck and how many of you are in here young enough to remember layaway? Amen. You went in early and, and you put stuff on layaway and you'd pay on it and 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 hopefully you had enough money <laughs> come Christmas or a couple weeks before Christmas that you get your stuff out of layaway. How many of you remember going to the back of the store? And they had the, where everybody had the, the big deal, and you would go in and get your, you'd pay on your layaway and you'd get it out. And you were so excited. I mean, it, when you came out after you'd been paying on layaway for six months, and you came out with uh, two buggies worth of stuff, people think, I mean, you didn't hit the lottery. I mean, you have won everything here because you got all this stuff. They didn't know you'd been scraping and scrounging for the last six months to pay on it. But we were, we were in a, a world, we lived in a world where uh, anticipation was something awesome where you had to work for something and you would save and you would give up this in order to get something you really wanted. How many of you have ever been like that in your life? And that seems like layaway to me. But nowadays, if we want something with a couple of clicks and tomorrow, if you're on Amazon Prime, you can probably have it. Amen? You can go down to Lowe's and get whatever tool a man desires just about. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? I mean, it's just awesome. I mean, you can go and you can go down, down to, to, uh, to the department store and you can get uh, clothes. You can get shoes. Get whatever you want. You don't even have to wait anymore. But along with that convenience also comes discontentment. And we get so discontented so quickly and so easily because we can't have what we want and have it right now. And so there's, a, there's this process that we go through in our lives that, that, is, that it's good to wait. You know, it's good to wait. The Bible says that if you wait upon the Lord, he says you're to wait upon him. And we don't want to wait anymore. We want God to come and do his thing and do it right now. How many of you know that's true? So I want to talk to us about how to be content. Because if you live in today's world and you deal with finances, you deal with stuff in your life, there's usually not enough money at the end of the month. There's usually enough uh, patience at the end of the day if you got kids. Come on. There, there's not enough patience. If you're driving down a four-lane road and you got that slow person over in the left-hand lane, how many can I get a witness? Officers, y'all hear my, my complaints right there. I'm an informal complaint. Hey, man, how many of you have been there? Amen. I, I was uh, coming from, from Lowe's the other day, uh, yesterday, or day before yesterday. And I was at a red light, and there was a car in front of me. And you know how many, uh, you, you, it's got to turn green before they can go. How many of you sat at the red light looking at the opposite red light to see when it's going to turn yellow so you can start ribbing your engine to go? <laughs> Amen. That's kind of, we're in a fast-paced world. So I'm behind this car, and... I'm waiting, and the, I'm in the inside lane, and the first vehicle on the outside lane, the light turns green, and they take off. Now, I have no place to be. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not, I don't have an appointment. I'm just coming home. Car takes off on this pickup truck. The car's sitting there. Probably two seconds. I find myself reaching for my horn because you know what went through my mind? Probably on the phone. What are they doing? Don't they know we got places to be? You know, that kind of stuff coming through your head? I had no place to be whatsoever. You know what? They pulled off, and it wasn't very long. Just, I mean, half a mile down the road. The 
the truck that took off first on this side. He got behind another slow vehicle that pulled out in front of him, and I passed him. My whole point is, I didn't gain anything. I wouldn't have gained anything by honking my horn. I still was where I needed to be when I needed to be. Amen? And so discontentment comes in. But Paul talks about how to be content. And I'm going to teach you today on how to be content. But now you're going to have to do something. I can teach you what God's Word says, but you have to apply God's Word. So how to be content. In Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 11 through 13, I'm going to read a couple verses and talk about some things, and then we'll pick up the last verse. The Bible says this. Paul speaking says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have, everybody say, learned. In whatever state that I am to be content. That means to be okay. That means to have, that actual word means um, to suppress uh, your desires. That's what that means. To suppress your desires. Okay? How many of you know that's tough? Verse 12 says, and I know how to, how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned, everybody say learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, Paul is setting the stage here for us to say to be content is something you're going to have to learn to do. Uh-oh. We thought God was the God of the universe and he was going to just do everything for us. When we got zapped and when we got saved, he zapped us and everything was perfect. Contentment came and now we're just okay with whatever God wants to do. How many of you know that's a lie? Come on, how many of you are saved in the house? How many of you deal with discontentment? Amen. The rest of you didn't raise your hands. You're liars. Okay, so we have a special time later for salvation and repentance for that. Amen. No, I'm kidding. So how can Paul say that I'm content in all things? He says, when I'm full, when he was in prison, he said, when I'm hungry, when I'm cold, and when, when there's nobody uh, around me that I know, I'm, I'm content. But when I'm full, when my, when my belly is full, when everything's going my way, I am also content. And Paul said, you can do this, but you've got to learn to do it. And that's a problem because we don't like to learn a lot of things anymore, especially when we get older. Amen. We don't want to, we don't do a lot of learning, you know, as the old saying is, you, it's hard to teach that old dog some new tricks. It's kind of the way we are as people. It's kind of hard to, well, why don't God just do it? He's God. He can do anything, can't he? Why don't he just fix me? Well, that's your problem. Amen. You got to learn how to do this. Now, how do we, how does Paul learn? There's two things that, that, uh, that we're going to look at just for a minute. On how does Paul, why does he tell us to learn to be content? How do we do that? How do we learn that? I mean, you ever went to that, dis, did, did anybody sign up for that class in high school, how not to be discontented? They didn't offer it in my class. They didn't even offer it when I, when, I went to, when I went to school to be a preacher. They didn't offer that. I'm thinking, man, this should be a number one class. How to be, not be discontented when you're a pastor. Amen. Amen? How to be content. When everything's not going your way. How to be content when everything is going your way. How to be content when you didn't, we didn't, you didn't get your way. Uh-oh. When you wanted something so bad, you got to suppress that because that might not be what God has for you right now. Paul says he learned. And so how do you learn to be content? Through God's Word. Did you know everything that will help you in life is in God's Word? If you learn how to be content, you learn that through God's Word. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, if, if, you're being dis, if you're in discontentment right now, how's that working out for you if you hadn't been in God's Word? God's Word will lead you and help you to learn how to be, in, be, be content with what you have. Amen? Paul's contentment came through Christ. Paul's contentment, his I'm okay, came through Christ. Watch this. In Philippians 4.13 says this. After he talks about a learning to be content in whatever state he's in, he says, but in this I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, see, he couldn't, he recognized he couldn't do this on his own. 
He was going to have to have some help. Where is that help going to come from? It's going to come from Jesus Christ. I can do all things. What are those all things? I can be content as long as I have Christ in my life. When Christ is men, m- removed, you see some of the most miserable, unhappy people, when, especially when they've known Christ and they've kind of stepped away from Christ, there are some unhappy, unpleasant people. Amen. I've been one of those. You preach. Oh, yeah. I was so discontented when I said, God, you know, I don't know if this thing's working for me. There was a little period of time that I stepped away from God. And you talking about discontent. And Bill, I was like the most miserable person on the face of the earth. But Christ, in Christ, through Christ, he gives you strength to learn how to suppress that desire to make you discontented. You know, there's things that God wants for you, and there's things that God has for you, and there's things that you want for you, and then there's things God says, I'm okay with you having that, but just not right now. And you know, a lot of times in our waiting, that's where we get discontented, and we're not content there. And Paul says, in all things, wherever I'm at, he uses the analogy of being completely hungry, empty, and completely full. In other words, anywhere in between that scale in your life, anywhere... Guess what? He says, I've learned to be content. So God wants great things for you. He really does. But sometimes you don't need them right now. I want to show you some things. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, the Bible says this. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So how do I get godliness and contentment together? Well, first I come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I get to know him and I say, Lord, you've got to help me in area, every area of my life. So I've gained God and I'm getting this, I'm learning to be content. And the more content that I am, guess what? The stronger Christian that I am. The stronger you, you are, the better you can handle situations the better you can walk through life and take care of kids and finances and juggle them and still be happy. Still have joy in your heart. Do you know joy comes from the Lord? Happy can almost be bought. That's about 30 days till the payment comes due. Go out and get you some nice clothes, put it on a credit card, and you think, man, I am looking spiffy today. 30 days from now, that $200 worth of clothes turns into $500 because of interest. And you're thinking, man, what, what was I thinking? You were happy. Now you're discontented. You know? Hey, man, God wants you to have nice things, though. Amen? So godliness with contentment is great gain. How many of you like to have great gain? How many of you like to get up in the morning and, and not look over there and, and, and in the mirror and say, who is that looking back at me that so looks like a sourpuss? Who is that? I mean, you just so you look at it and you think, man, is that the best you got this morning? You know, you want to go back, get in bed, get back up and go look in the mirror and make sure, you know, make sure you get something, you're the same person. So contentment with is great gain as long as it's coupled with godliness. You can be content. So what can we do in order to become content? What is what is the plan? How can we learn? What's the process? Now, look, in 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to be able to tell you a couple things uh, about maybe three or four things on how to lo- start learning to be content. Um, Doc, when you went to school, you, you went a long time to be a doctor. You didn't learn everything in the first class, did you? You went time and time again, and you repeated that information till you got it in your spirit, amen, Till you got it in intellectually in you. You got it. It's, so it's a process. So God's not going to zap you and give you everything today. Amen? Because tomorrow, I'll pre- uh, next week I'll preach something different. So you got to go learn how to do some things. Amen? So watch this. <clears throat> number one. What's the number one thing that you can do in order to find contentment in your life? Put God first in your life. A lot of our discontentment comes when we have a portion of God here, but he's not first. When God's not first in your life as a a Christian, you will be, listen to me, you will be discontented. And you say, well, I'm not discontented. 
I, 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 I'm good. You're really not good. If you come and someone says something to you at church, and, and that, that upsets you. Well, where was you at last week? Well, what are you, what, 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 why? What are you, what are you trying to say? I wouldn't, I'm not a Christian? Nobody said that. But see, discontentment, when God's not first, when he's somewhere second, third, or fourth, really he's not anything to you at all. I got scripture for that. Watch this. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, he says, the word of God says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. I'm here to tell you that there's no part of you that shouldn't put God first. In everything you do, he's got to be first. If he's second, you'll be discontented in a bunch of areas in your life. So number one thing, put God first. Put him first. That means changes. See, this is the learning part we don't like. That means we got to regroup and we got to shuffle some things around in our lives to put him first. Amen? Because right now, God's somewhere in this mix, but he's really not number one. He's just there. I have a thing that I do often, not as often as I used to because I'm smarter now, Cookie. I'm just a lot more intelligent. (laughs) <laughs> take a piece of paper top to bottom draw your line side to side draw your line make a big cross you got four boxes now and in one box over here you put urgent and priority just write it at the top over here on the left urgent and priority and over on this side over here on the other time you, you you just put priority and then down here you can you can just put kind of urgent but over here in the last Bible, you know, whenever I get to it, just, just write down there. And, and a lot of times there's things in our life. I know when we first started the church here, one of the things, I had this box made up. And one of the things was we needed parking. We had no parking. So in the box of urgent and priority was gravel. And, man, I'm telling you, it stayed there. But when the first summer came along, we could park in the grass. That gravel moved somewhere down over off the page because it wasn't that big of a deal. But come about September when we first got that rain and we realized we couldn't park very much longer into the grass, guess what? It moved right back up to urgent priority. Boy, I mean, that's the way we do God a lot of times. He's on the page, but he's really not first. He's just somewhere in the mix, and a lot of times he's in that box whenever I get around to it, if there's time. But when something goes wrong in our lives, boom, he's back at urgent and priority in our lives. God really, he's not something that you get to move around in your life wherever you want him, whenever you want him. He's first or he's nothing at all. The Bible says in Revelations that he wishes you were either hot or cold because if, you, if you're not, he'll spew you from his mouth. God's got to be first. So in your first step of you learning how to be content, you've got to learn to put God first. And that's going to look a little different for each one of us in this room. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. In Matthew 6, 33, he says this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I like to rephrase that last part of that verse and say, tomorrow's got its own stuff. There'll be plenty when you get there. Seek you first the kingdom of God. God wants you to have some things that you desire in your life. But again, as I said, maybe not right now. Put him first. If you read this in context in Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about the things of the world. He's talking about your food, your raiment, your clothes, those type things. He said, but seek me first, and I'll be sure you got these things. It's very important in, in our society today that God is first, that we don't put things in front of God and say, well, God wants me to have these things. You may not be able to handle some things right now. If God's not first in your life, you're hindering him from giving you the things that you may desire. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have uh, finances. God wants you to have things so you can bless others. Amen? I'm like a friend of mine said, I won't call his name, but a friend of mine said this one. He said, the Lord has blessed me with things so that I can let other people borrow my things. 
Amen. Resources are great. I like this person because I borrow a lot of stuff from him. Amen. I want Lord to keep blessing him. He, he's got him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Seek you first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. Who's first? The things are God. You got to learn to seek God first. How many of you do? How many of you have ever done this? Don't raise your hands. Went and done something and realized when you just maybe signed the papers or you got far enough into it, you couldn't back out of it. And you thought, oh, Lord. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. And you start pleading with God, oh, God, bless this. Oh, God, send your blessings on it. See, it wasn't that maybe God didn't want you to have it. He just wanted you to seek him first about it, and then you'd have peace about it, and you would be not being discontented. You'd be content with what he gave you. See, it's not that he don't want you to have things. It's not that he don't want you to prosper. It's not that he doesn't want you to be in this position or that position. He says, seek me first, though. See, God, the Bible says God is a jealous God. In Exodus chapter 20, he's about verse 4, he says, he is a jealous God. You know what he's jealous for? You, your attention. You mean God is jealous for, for my attention? He is. He wants to be first in your life. And if he's not first, he's not second, third, or fourth. He's first or nothing. My daddy used to say that losers just, it's the first, I mean, that if you lose, that's just, uh, what do you, what, um, I just lost my train of thought. Second place is first loser. There it is. Thank you. Amen. You ever heard of that? And maybe it wasn't a popular thing, just maybe it's me and you. Okay, <clears throat> we'll move on then. It's not one of those moments, Jason. Number two. So number one, you put, put God first in your life. And number two, put your focus on Christ. You say, well, Pastor, isn't that the same thing? Kind of, but not really. Watch this. This is what the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. The Bible says that, you, that he, speaking of God, when he says you, he's speaking of God, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Most of our discontentment comes because we really don't trust God to do what he says he'll do. When our mind is stayed on him, in other words, our focus is on him, our, no matter what we do, he'll be automatically be first. Our problem is not God being first. Our problem is our mind wondering, can, can or should we make God first in this? Is God really, does he really care about this? Does he really care if I purchase this or if I buy that? Does he really care? I think he cares a lot more than what we think. If he knows the hairs that are numbered on our head. If he knows every time a sparrow falls from the, earth, uh, from the air. If he knows when the flower the, of, the, of the field, when it withers. If he knows that, I think he's more interested in your little things in your life than what you think. It's simply because we're, our mind is not stayed on him. It's not focused on him. Just so some of you are wondering... I've gave him a little bit more brain space because he don't have to keep this numbered so he can keep up with yours. Amen? <laughs> Look here. God is interested in your life, the little things in your life. He really is. The problem is we become discontented when we don't keep our minds on him. And then we realize in the after the afterthought. You may have an afterthought. Well, I didn't think that in all the way through. Anybody ever done that? I've done a few things in my life. I just didn't think that one all the way through. And it caused me to be in discontent. Was it God punishing me? No, no. He just said, I'll let you do it the way you want to. But if you stay focused on me, guess what? We can work this thing. It'll be a lot better. Amen? Amen. I know you're getting this in your spirit. Amen? Number three. I got 22 of these, so just beware if you're visitors. No, no, I'm kidding. I just got three today. <laughs> Number three. Here's a big one on how to be content, how to be okay where you are. My wife is uh, more calm than I am. Is she in this room? 
I'm just checking on. I have to see. I want to be content. My mind was not on Christ. It was stayed on her. Think it all the way through. So she ain't in here. And so. But my wife is a lot more, as y'all know, laid back than myself. Okay? She's content. It don't really matter. I mean, she look. She's just a content person. She's okay if you, if, you, if you talk to her, if you don't talk to her. She's okay at being at the house all week by herself. She's okay with four or five people coming by over a period of a few days. But um, she's content. She's just a calm person. She doesn't get that excited about much. You know, she's pretty. She's my anchor, if you will. Me, on the other hand... Sometimes my mind wanders away from Christ. My mind ain't focused on Christ. And I, there's some things out there I want to do and I want to get and buy. And she says, nah, it's really not the time. So most of the time what I do so I can be in complete discontentment is I go do it and then tell her I did it. <laughs> Amen? And then if I want to bring myself back to center and be content, I'll say, well, Ethan wanted it. And then everything's okay and I'm good in my heart except for the Lord saying, you just lied to her. You wanted that. Discontentment. Amen. So how do we handle this thing? And what is the number? And I believe this to be the number one thing that keeps us discontented with life because we want stuff, right? How many of you know? That there's more commercial time on a 30-minute television program than the actual program. Why? Because they want you to buy their product. And it can range any, anything in a 30-minute uh, television program from shampoo to underwear. I anything in between. It, it doesn't matter. Cars, whatever. Your mind's just jumping. I want that, man. I want that. Man, that'd be great. Man, I'd like to have that. I'd like to have that shampoo make me smell good sitting in my new underwear, sitting in my new car. Man, that would be great. <laughs> you just spent $80,000 watching television just that quick. Man, this is awesome. You get it and you're discontented, right? So watch this. The number one thing that I believe, now this is, this, I don't preach much opinion. Now this is Bible. But this is just an opinion of what I believe is the number one thing that will keep you discontented, and that's covetousness. Now, let me read some scripture to you. In Luke 12, chapter 12, verse 13, I'm going to read a few, few scriptures, and then we'll talk about it, and then I'm going to close. So you, you just felt contentment come right on you, didn't you? You just, just welled right up in you there. Luke 12, 13 says this, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, did, Hey, did you just see contentment, right there, discontentment right there in the brother? Hey, hey, I'd like to have what he's got. Covetousness. Right out of the gate. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. That's a huge thing. This is why I think covetousness is a big problem in our discontentment or us being content. Because we want things. Human nature says get all you can and can all you can get. Amen? That's what he wants. We want, we're striving for your dollar. The, the, the economy, the federal government wants you in debt up to your eyeballs and making payments on something so that that helps the economy roll on so they can print more money that we don't have to back. Come on. And when you don't have money, I'm here to tell you, you're discontented. I don't care if you if you make fifty dollars a week or five thousand dollars. It doesn't matter if you don't. You get to a level where you still want more. And you're discontented when you can't have, oh, I just want to buy that. It's just a pack of gum. <laughs> hey, I've been there before. I've been where I, my Lord, I just wanted, I just wanted to buy some pork chops. I mean, just some old pork chops, cheapest thing in the market. Well, it was, it's not anymore. But we think we're entitled to something. And when you think you're entitled to something, discontentment shows up in a big way. 
I just want to let somebody know, especially our younger congregation here today, you're not entitled to anything. Zero. Now, there is one gift that I would uh, encourage you to go after, and that's salvation. But you're not even entitled to that. It's a gift. But discontentment comes when we have covetousness in our heart. And that just doesn't now necessarily mean possession of things. That means wanting what somebody else has. No matter if it's a possession or a gift or a talent. Come on. Amen. I thought you'd like it. The Lord's been dealing with me on it. Verse 16. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, now this is Jesus speaking, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. And when God calls you a fool, it's a bad deal. I don't know, I was raised in a house where we couldn't say fool. You probably did once at my house, and then you were, you understood from that point on, you don't say fool, okay? But when God says, calls a man a fool, there's got to be something bad behind that. And here's what we learn. He says, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, then whose will those things be in which you have provided? In other words, that you've earned those crops and all of those possessions. Who are they going to be then? Fool. So, he is, so is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. There's the key. That supports my first two points of this morning of if you put God first in everything you do, he doesn't have a problem. He didn't have a problem with this farmer making money and having crops. He had a problem with the farmer saying, it was all me. And I'm going to do with it what I want to. I've got a plan for my stuff. And it doesn't include God. Because the last verse says, right here, let's read it again. He says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In other words, God's not in his picture. God wants you to have things. God wants you to be content. God is okay with that. But your contentment comes in Christ. As Paul said, it's in Christ who strengthens me. That's where my contentment comes. Amen? I don't know about you, but I've been discontented a lot in my life. And I look back over my life and I realize my discontentment was primarily coming because God wasn't in the picture when I started. See, it's God that, that in this parable, it's God that gave the rain to produce the crops. It's God that gave the nutrients in the soil when the seed was planted for it to grow and to come up and prosper and yield more. It was God that had all this plan. So it's not against God's plan for you to, to have plenty, for you to have things. It is against God's plan for you to think that it's all about you and you to hoard up what you got. The Bible says, talks about a man that steals. He said, if a man steals, let him steal no more. But let him go out and earn a wage that he may receive the wage that he may in turn bless others with what he's got. Gage, what was it this morning? What was that great saying you said, your grandpa said this morning about giving to the... Give to the needy, not the greedy. I like that. <laughs> give to the needy, not the greedy. God wants you to take your possessions and Give. If we look at our lives, we spend way more on us than we do anything else, anybody else. Hey, I'm at the front of the line. I'm, I'm, here it is. Are you saying we shouldn't do that? Oh, no, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. The Bible also teaches us that we should enjoy the fruit of our labors. Guess what? In the fruit of labor, you can be content. Amen? I enjoy going buying some things. 
I work hard. I enjoy buying a few things. Amen. I mean, sometimes I may have to finagle and almost tell a lie. Is it almost a lie when it's really <laughs> to my wife? It, it, it is. I'm discontented in my heart then. Because, you know, I, I, I love to do construction. Many of you know I like construction and I love to build things. Oh, glory to God. One of the greatest things about building, Jason, is that when I'm going to do a project, I am going to figure out how I can buy a new tool. I'm discontented when I can't buy a new tool. That's what I tell my wife. I'm just, my heart's broken. I can't buy a new tool for this project. She said, how many tools do you need? I said, just one more. Then the next job comes along. I just need one more. You know, if I had this, honey, we're so discontented. You know what I told for Father's Day this past year? The kids said, well, Dad, what do you want besides underwear and socks and T-shirts? I said, Nothing. I was doing laundry yesterday. I'll get back to that story in just a minute. I was doing laundry yesterday, and as I was folding some of my T-shirts, man, I was anointed. I was praying over this. I said, God, let them last till Christmas. Let them last till Christmas. Anybody got one of those drawers full of T-shirts that the collar's gone out of? My wife says, throw that away. I said, this is my comfortable shirt. I love to sit in that shirt, live in that shirt and those t- shorts that are ripped all the way over, and they look like, good Lord, what happened to you, man? Did you get run through the combine or what, you know? But they're comfortable. But I was looking at my t-shirts, and I got like three. Don't get me a bunch of t-shirts for Christmas, okay? <clears throat> my kids are getting that, okay? So, but I was praying, Lord, let these things last. Amen. But I need t-shirts. And I'll be contented when I get t-shirts. So back to my story. So in Father's Day, kids, I said, Dad, what do you want? So that's T-shirts, socks, and underwear. I said, you know, I'd like to have one of those big stands that my new miter box that I've, uh, my, my new uh, miter saw that I got down at Delta Men's that I really needed because I got two. But I bought it because it was for a good cause. I felt good in my heart. I was contented when I purchased that. And my wife said, why did you buy that? Don't you have a new one? And that's pretty new, but it's not new. It's not this color, though. So I got that saw, and I've used it like three times all year. Hey. And I said, but I'd like to have one of those base stands that this goes on. He said, all right. So the kids went together and, and bought me one. Man, it's a nice big old rascal, I guess. It's still in the box under the carport. I haven't even opened it. But I thought I would be content if I had this piece of equipment. This thing would make me happy. It made me so happy I hadn't even opened it. Man, that is, wow. You know what that was? I was speaking from, I, I, don't, I don't know, I just, just give me this, it sounds great. I was discontented. I, I wanted so much stuff, just pick something. But see, if we're in Christ, you know what? We can do things differently. We can be contented and we can have the good gifts God wants for us and they'll be useful. God's, God's allowed each one of us in this room to be to be. Um, be healthy as the most part, to, to have finances in this room, to, to eat pretty much every day, to come to great facilities, to have talents and anointings, and God's nowhere in our picture for us to use them. And God says, I want to use you. Put me first and I'll show you. Maybe you feel like I'm ill-equipped. I, I, I don't know how to do it. How do I, I've never ran in those circles that make church work. Well, it's real simple. We hadn't either. We just start doing something, amen? We start doing something, and and we keep God first. He refines it and defines it, and we say, this is what God wants. But he's first, and so we go after it. When God's in the middle of it, you won't be discontented. You may have a bad day. There may be a heartache along the way, but you won't be discontented because you know your purpose and your focus is what God wants you to do. Amen? How many of you know that it's better? It's better to be in the will of God than to be out of the will of God. And I see it so many times where people, Lee, will you come to piano? I see it so many times where people, they love God, but they're so out of the will of God. You know why? Because they want something that's not for them. Their covetousness is greater than their desire to put God first. They want this. I want that ministry. 
well, maybe God wants you to have that ministry, but not right now. Well, I, 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 want, I want that house over there. Well, God doesn't have a problem with you having that, a house like that, but maybe it's not time for you right now. You know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm not the dullest either. When my kids got married, and I told them all the financial advice I could give them. It took about 30 seconds. But I told them this about finances. Don't ever look across the street at what somebody else has and say, well, I know where they work. I know how much they make. I ought to be able to have that too, and I can't even have that. I'm struggling over here. I said, you take care of what's coming in your house, and you never spend more than what's coming in your place, and you may, you may want that over there, guess what? But you never know. They may have three mortgages on their house. They may have a rich uncle that died and gave them a lot of money that you don't know anything about. But as long as you stay within your means and you do what God's wanting you to do, guess what? You're going to be content driving, driving a moped over a Silverado pickup. If that's what God's having you do, you'll be okay there. And when God gets you past that point, there's this principle in the Bible. It says you're never going to have much till you get take care of the little. Y'all remember the story. He says, who is faithful over the little shall be ruler over much. And when you get to that level, when you handle that, and God says, you can handle that, and you're keeping me first, and you're not wandering around on me right here, and you're still putting me first, you're still focused on me, then I'll give you a little more. And then when you can handle that, and you keep me first, and you stay focused on me, then I'll give you more. Come on, this is the way this thing works. It's a biblical principle. It's in the Bible. If you do this, I'll do this. But that doesn't mean, look, if you can't sing and your desire is to sing, but you can't sing a lick, something's wrong. You pick, pick another calling. <laughs> I don't sing. Oh, I would love to sing. Oh, I want to sing so bad sometimes when my kids, when Sam and them was at home, Tim, they'd be practicing. Boy, it sounds so good. And boy, I'd be back there, close my door. But I'd be back there, boy, and I'd be just singing, boy. Just. They wouldn't let me come up and sing with them. We'd be going down the road. A lot of times I love Christmas music. We'd be going down the road, going to see my parents or something. And we'd be just singing. Boy, my wife would be singing with the radio. How many of you ever do that? Rusty, you ever sing with the radio? Yeah, yeah, just by yourself, huh? Yeah. My wife be singing, and I just, boy, I just jump in, you know. And I'd be singing along, and man, I think it sounded like to me somebody's fixing to call me, give me a recording contract. I mean, that's what it sounded like in my ears. And man, I'm just singing along, and my, and my wife says, "Hey, hey, do you hear that part? What part? You sing right here, and I'm going to sing here." I'm thinking. Won't you sing over and I'll sing over here? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I couldn't sing. To me, I sound great. To the Lord, it's a joyful noise and it sounds good. But you don't want me singing. That is not my calling. Amen? I, I, I'm not going to be faithful enough in the little for him to increase me much in that area because I cannot sing. I've got enough sense to know that. You need to, too. But do not ever use that as an excuse that God can't use you. So put God first as I close. Put God first. Stay focused on God. Come on, these are key things. Stay focused on God and beware of covetousness. Because the enemy will pull you away with covetousness. You know he's going to use it, right? He used it, the devil used that on Jesus. If you worship me, I'll give you all of this stuff that you see when he's on a high mountain. All of these cities, I'll give them to you. What was he doing? He was tempting the Lord Jesus Christ with something. It's called covetousness. He was tempting him to have something. And Jesus knew all along. Well, technically, I already got it. You know why? Because he was stayed, he was focused on what his father's business was that sent him. He says, my, my, my will is to do the will of my father. 
I just pray that we can get the mind of Christ in this building. Because I'm telling you, 2023, if the Lord tarries, and I'm, look, I'm looking for him this afternoon. If 2023 tarries, I mean, if, if, if the Lord tarries and 2023 comes, we've got to get busy about winning souls. When's the last, don't, don't raise your hands, when's the last time we, we won somebody to the Lord? See, that's keeping your mind on your main business. You don't have to be a preacher to win somebody to the Lord. You don't have to be a deacon. You don't have to teach Sunday school. You don't have to do any of those things. What you do have to do, though, is keep your mind on Christ. You have to stay focused on Him. And, and when you do that, guess what? You're not going to be drawn away from doing all your energies and time over here when you ought to be winning souls. When you ought to be talking to somebody about the Lord. This thing is coming to an end, and it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I said? This thing's coming to an end. The world is, you know, it's coming to an end and it's coming fast. There's going to be some change that's going to happen. And I believe rapidly, and this is why I believe this, and I'm going to close. In, in the upcoming year, in America, you're going to see some things change that you never thought would change. Because I believe over the next couple of years... With, with what's going on, what has, what has happened in the last couple of years and what's going to happen in the, it's going to be a major push to move away from everything God. And I'm not being political, but I'm being political. The Respect for Marriage Act that passed the Senate this week with 12 conservatives crossing the aisle says that a man and a man can get married, a woman and a woman can get married, polygamy is okay, and a list of other things. Do you know that I won't be able to make that statement very soon if it continues? I won't be able to make that statement that Jesus says that's wrong without going to jail. I won't be able to make that statement that a man and a man get married and God says he doesn't like it. It's an abomination to God and it's sin and it's wrong. Because see, it's going to be a hate crime then. Hate speech. Just get ready. I wish I knew. If you know, you can spit it out. If you don't, that's all right. I wish I knew how many registered so-called Christians in this little area voted last week. You don't, you don't know that. Often. I don't know if that data's come out yet, but that would be nice to know how many registered Christians, you know, that we would call Christians that say they go to church. You're kidding. Wow. He said there was a thousand seven voted in the city, fifteen hundred registered. There's twenty eight hundred twenty three. If is that the right number, thereabouts? 26. What's wrong with us, church? That, that's why we have the laws being passed that we do. That's why we have these things passed. We say we're against them. We don't do anything about it. You know why? Because our mind's not stayed on Christ. You get focused on Christ and what he wants, guess what? You, everybody you know, you'll be dragging them down there to vote. Okay, I'm going to get off of that because I know you're not interested in that, but it bothers me greatly. Amen. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Amen. Will you stand with me all across this building?